So, in the immortal words of Doctor Strange, We're in the endgame now. Hey guys, it's Sean O'Connell, the managing editor here at Cinema Blend, back with another breakdown of WandaVision. We are up to episode 7 of the show. Uh, I'm going to be diving into full spoilers for the latest episode of the new Disney Plus show from Marvel Studios. So if you haven't yet caught up with episode 7, make sure that you bow out now. Go back and check out uh, all of our WandaVision analysis up until this point. We are running through each episode of the show as we go into the final stretch and break down what will be a nine episode season in the very first series reaching Disney Plus from Marvel Studios, the fantastic WandaVision. Okay, so you're here, you've made it this far, I'm going to assume that you have watched everything that happened in episode seven. I mentioned the Doctor Strange clip about us being in the end game now because this felt like one of those episodes where as you get close to the end of a season in almost any uh, series of television, I, I talked about this in Game of Thrones a lot when we were watching this, you get to an episode towards the end of the season where pieces start to get moved around the board because they are approaching the big finale. And that a lot of that stuff happened in episode seven and even looking at people's reactions to things that happened they felt like it was a bit of a filler episode but i that's not accurate at all because there's so much stuff that got confirmed and advanced in this story that it was really jaw-dropping the number of things that got broken down and there's three main bits that i want to focus on which talk to uh talk to me a bit about like how wandavision has established itself in this little corner of the mcu but also where i think some really big things in the mcu are going forward and so we have to start uh at the end of the episode which is the true about Agnes. So we've been talking on these episodes, the different analysis videos that we were pretty confident that Catherine Hahn's character, uh, Agnes was responsible in some way, shape, or form for what was going on with Wanda. And the show did multiple things throughout the course of its seven episodes to sort of throw us off to that. Things that really indicated that Wanda was the one responsible for everything going on. But, you know, just from an outsider's point of view, when you look at the way that the show has been cast, like you don't hire someone of the caliber of Catherine Hahn if she's not playing someone significant. And up until episode seven, it was still almost believed, especially in the Halloween episode where she was uh, playing along with Vision at the outskirts of town. Like, was she under Wanda's control also, or has she been faking it this whole time? Well, it turns out she was faking it. And it turns out that Agnes is actually uh, Agatha Harkness, which is a character that fans who've read the Marvel comics over the years will understand, but you might not have, and so I'm going to break her down right now. Agatha Harkness's origin story in the comics is again kind of convoluted one of those characters who's been around for a really long time used in different titles she first showed up in the fantastic four she was a nanny for um reed richards and sue richards son franklin because he had unique powers and they wanted somebody who'd be able to take care of him uh agnes uh or agatha harkness and we see i'm gonna, I'm gonna mix up agatha and agnes a lot uh, agatha harkness is a witch she's a sorceress uh, she has a lot of the similar powers to wanda as well too in terms of the spells that she's able to concoct and she's a, a perfect foil for wanda throughout the course of her origin in the comics and stories that she popped up in she was both wanda's mentor um, and then also an enemy to her after a, after a while. And she, you know, has an origin that dates back to many, many years. I think as, as far back as 500 years, um, if not even longer than that. She was part of the Salem Witch Trials. She's been around forever. Part of the reason why Agatha Harkness is so significant to the story that WandaVision is trying to tell, though, is because she has a direct connection to Wanda's twins in an important storyline that took place with Scarlet Witch fighting against Agatha Harkness and it's during that moment when it's revealed that Wanda's twins are actually they they have a piece of the villain Mephisto uh inside of them and Wanda essentially absorbed uh, some of his power and and created this uh artificial insemination <laughs> or um how would you put it immaculate conception almost of her two twins and and agatha had a role in that essentially and agatha at some point too and i wonder if this is going to play out in wandavision because if it does it's going to be pretty tragic she goes the extra mile to almost make wanda forget that she even had children uh wipes the memory of the kids clean from wanda and that might happen in this uh in this series in the last two episodes that we have and if it is, it's going to be pretty devastating for Wanda. Like, I think she's been, you know, everything about this show has been about family and bringing Vision back and, and building a family unit that's based on sitcoms, you know, the recognizable unit of, of family. And if Wanda finds out that her twins are not real or if that her memory is wiped from it by, by Agatha, that's going to be 
pretty devastating. So now that we know that Agnes is Agatha Harkness and that there's there's dark magic going on in Westview, you look at a couple of other instances, like there are two other characters who are significant to the uh, mythology of Agatha Harkness, and one would be Mephisto. Mephisto we've talked a lot about on these analysis breakdowns. He's essentially the devil in the MCU, and I have mentioned a couple of times in breaking down some of these WandaVision episodes that it's possible in her grief that Wanda tried to make a deal with the devil to come up with a solution to how she can live the rest of her life, her existence with Vision. And if you gave her just a safe bubble somewhere where she and Vision could be together, that the devil would almost grant that wish for her, but she'd have to give something back in return. I think that's probably the twins, and I think we're gonna get to some bit of um, resolution where you learn that Wanda did sort of sell her soul to the devil through Agatha probably, and through Mephisto. And the reason why I keep bringing up Mephisto is because of that deliberate shot of the fly on the curtains. And, you know, I think that Mephisto has actually been materialized as a fly in the comics before. The fly is absolutely something that's demonic and satanic and it's used in horror films like the Amityville Horror, you know, to represent the presence of the devil or the presence of Satan. The other character who's associated with uh, Agatha Harkness is a character named Nicholas Scratch, which, which would be her son. And of course, if you think about the name of the rabbit, uh, the rabbit is Senor Scratchy. He was part of the talent show back in episode number two. He shows up again in this episode when uh, Agatha's holding him on the couch. Uh, the rabbit being present, I wouldn't be surprised if Ralph, uh, who Agatha's constantly referencing, or Agnes is constantly referencing, if Ralph is Mephisto, and if Senor Scratchy is Nicholas Scratch, and then you've got this sort of triumvirate of Agatha Harkness established. But, you know, it was really cool to see that moment when Wanda goes down into the basement. The basement ends up being a lair. She gets an amazing theme song that goes with uh, the revelation that, that it's been Agatha all along. Tremendous reveal. Um, again, something we've speculated on, but it's fun to have it confirmed. Welcome to the MCU, Agatha Harkness. Great casting by Katherine Hahn. Okay, let's get to the birth of, so that's the introduction of a villain in the MCU. Let's get to the birth of a new hero. Uh, Monica Rambeau, as she passes through the, uh, the energies of the Hex, has been warned uh, multiple times that it's changing her on a cellular level. Well, we just got the birth of Photon. So Monica Rambeau in the comics, she gets powers, very similar to Carol Danvers' powers, and she, even for a while, goes by the name Captain Marvel. And after a while, thinking that it's um, wrong for her to be using a name that once belonged to the original Marvel, she also decided she was going to change her name to Photon, uh, and had a lot of similar powers to what Carol has. Carol's powers are aren't fully defined yet in the MCU and um, and photons gonna take on some of those bits you can see you got to go back through this episode and watch the scene of Monica going through the hex and listen to it with subtitles on there are key moments uh, of dialogue that are put in there uh, of Nick Fury of Maria Rambo of Carol who shows up in this episode uh, through dialogue only and these are the things that are the building blocks of Monica Rambo and her introduction to the MCU with her powers and it's stunning when she comes out of the the energy field and is inside the hex and is now showing off her powers and she doesn't transition she doesn't get rewritten she keeps her sword outfit which I thought was pretty prominent she's got the glow about her now and photon that's a little bit of a hint toward her power. Um, she's able to channel various types of energies and essentially reconvert her physical matter into uh, the energy of her choice. Sometimes it's radioactive waves, sometimes it's gamma rays, um, and she can essentially power herself for an unlimited amount of time. And she can do other things, flight, super strength. These are all things that she will be able to convey. But I'm sure all of this is gonna get explored, not just in the last two episodes, of WandaVision, but also in Captain Marvel 2, of which Monica has been confirmed to be a part. Tayana Paris is going to be uh, appearing alongside Brie Larson in that film. And how will Carol respond when she finds out that Monica um, has powers now? That's what I'm saying. When people talk about the pacing of this episode and saying that, like, oh, not a lot happened, it felt like it was a, a filler episode. You got not only the introduction of a major villain in the MCU, but you got the birth of a new hero uh, in Monica Rambeau, fully absorbing her powers and becoming Photon now. And there's a moment in the, in the episode where Scarlet Witch kind of confronts her and Photon holds her ground. I'm going to keep calling her Photon until the MCU decides to call her something else. Um, but if you go back through old episodes when they were walking through S.W.O.R.D. and they passed the photo of Maria Rambeau, uh, her flight name was Photon. And so I can obviously see Monica taking on 
that name as her superhero moniker uh, in honor of her mother. That would be beautiful if that happened. Okay, I, I'm still in on the theory that um, Billy, the way that Billy talks and the way of, of Billy's powers, where he mentions that like it's very noisy in his head and he hates it. And then when he's sitting next to Agnes at the time and he says, you're very quiet, like the way that he describes his powers reminds me so much of Charles Xavier. And I'm not getting off the theory that the idea of mutants being created in Westview is an end game of uh, WandaVision as well too. And everything about this just feels like Charles Xavier. I I'm staying on record as saying that I think some version of Charles Xavier is going to show up in this, whether it's recast and it's just a person who was in Westview when the hex got expanded or something's going to happen. It's I don't think Billy is going to end up becoming like the early version of Professor Xavier in this universe. But the way that he describes his powers sounds very much like Charles. Um, so put a thumbtack in that one as well, too, because I'm not off the Charles Xavier bandwagon. But I want to go back to the Nexus commercial. All the commercials uh, throughout WandaVision in the previous six episodes have had um, deeper meaning to them, obviously. We've talked about uh, Hydra connections, and we've talked about even last week's, which was sort of this metaphysical commentary about how magic might not be the cure for the problem that you're dealing with right now. This boy who was stuck on an island and was starving, and he was given a snack as a solution, but this, he couldn't open the snack, and it didn't help him, and the solution created by magic eventually failed him, and so if you put Wanda in the place of the kid, and you realize that magic isn't necessarily curing her grief, that was, again, a really deep way to sort of comment on what's going on here. You might ask yourself what Nexus is, and again, this is a reference to the comics, um, and I think this is laying the groundwork for much larger things that are going to happen in the MCU, and this is where we're back to the multiverse. So we've discussed the concept of the multiverse, which is uh, other existences that mirror our own and take place at the exact same time and that there are various um, versions of these other characters that we know which explains how uh, Pietro is able to cross over and it doesn't look like Aaron Taylor Johnson, he looks like Evan Peters uh, from the Fox universe. So it's a multiverse, it's another version of Quicksilver who's taking place someplace else but now he can come back over into the MCU. And we have to break down that mid credit scene to figure out if Pietro is fully under the control of Agatha, and I think he is, and that would be kind of a game changer too, because then he's not the Pietro from the other universe, or he is, and that's going to be too confusing. I don't really want to branch onto that right now, because there's so much um, undiscovered about this, but the, the relevance of the Nexus, and I'm going to read this directly from a uh, definition of it that exists online. The Nexus, in the Marvel comics, is a cross-dimensional gateway which provides a pathway to any and all possible realities. And this includes realities between realities. It is unknown whether it was created by some being or just if it's the one place in the entire multiverse where all realities naturally intersect. So there's a ton of universes going on out there. And they're all operating at the same time. And the place where they intersect is called the Nexus. And we get a commercial describing the Nexus medication <laughs> that is telling you that you're not the focus of all of this, you know, or are you? Or this universe that you've created, it's an antidepressant. This universe that you've created as a solution to your depression and a solution to your grief is the Nexus of all the stuff going on. It's the most on the nose reference um, from the Marvel comics that has been included in WandaVision up to this point. And it obviously points to the fact that Westview or the work that's being done here between both Agatha and Wanda. And it feels like Wanda's grip on the hex is starting to fade, the way that things are glitching out. All of this is tied to the fact that, that this area is going to become the focal point of the multiverse. And the multiverse is about to expand out huge in the MCU. We have been tracking down the rumors that the third Spider-Man movie is going to include villains from other Sony properties, pulling in Alfred Molina as Dr. Octopus and Jamie Foxx as Electro. We know that Doctor Strange is going to get into the multiverse because the title of his sequel is Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. And so when you hear Nexus, if you're a Marvel Comics fan, you understand that like, all right, cool. So we've identified Westview and this uh, experiment that Wanda is going through at the urging of Agatha Harkness is absolutely going to be the center point 
of the explosion of the multiverse from here on out. And you can go into so many different directions about where that can go. That could be how you bring in the X-Men. That could bring how you bring in the Fantastic Four if you want to. That could even be a way that you pull in characters such as Punisher or Daredevil from the, from the um, Netflix shows if you wanted to go that route. I think that Kevin Feige and the folks at Marvel have a lot of tricks up their sleeve. And we're going to get to see a lot of amazing places that it goes from WandaVision. We're going to look back on WandaVision, I'm fairly confident, and say that's the moment that Marvel really spun off in a wild new direction. So we have two episodes left to go. And there's a rumor out there that the last two episodes are an hour each. The rumor actually was that the, the last three episodes are an hour each. This one ended up being about 37 minutes, really down to 30 by the time you shave off previously on and the um the long credits and again this one had a mid-credit sequence for the very first time and it was just pietro sort of confronting monica before she goes down into the the lair and it suggested that, she, that he was uh, being manipulated by agatha and under his control but we'll see how that plays out in the next thing i don't know if that means that the next two episodes are going to be an hour each it feels like the finale would be an hour that kind of makes sense to me but as we talked about at the beginning of this episode this was the one that sort of moved everybody to the edge of the playing field and now they're going to get on it for the last two episodes as we sort of mainline uh, the finale of wandavision so meet me back here next week we're we will break down and analyze everything that happened in episode eight. We will do a preview of things that are going to happen in the finale. Uh, believe me, we'll discuss everything that's going on in WandaVision in detail for the for weeks to come and how it affects the MCU. To make sure that you don't miss any of this on our YouTube channel, go down, hit subscribe, turn on your notifications, and I'll meet you back here for another breakdown of WandaVision next week.